So welcome. Uh, welcome back to the afternoon of day one. Uh, we have a number of talks today, and we're going to try and uh, stay on time. So thanks for uh, getting back here. We've had a great beginning to the morning, uh, talking about um, uh, power and politics and protest uh, and, and, and Russia. So I'm very excited, and I hope you are too. I have a couple of quick announcements. Um, first of all, uh, since we've been talking about getting involved and local politics, the New York voter registration deadline is tomorrow. And this young gentleman has voter registration forms for anyone who would like to um, register to vote in New York 19 for the upcoming election. And so if you want to raise your hand, he'll come over and hand out some forms. Thank you very much. Um, local politics at its best. I love it. Um, one other announcement. Uh, Leon Botstein earlier talked about the pluses and minuses of technology and these things. Uh, we all have them. We never know what to do with them, never know how to use them. We are trying something out this year. It's an app called Tribo. Uh, we heard uh, some talk about tribalism. But the idea is actually to not connect us with the whole world, but to connect us with a tribe of people we're interested in. And uh, this conference is the first ever use of this new app, Tribo. So it's in beta. But you can go to the App Store and download Tribo, T-R-I-B-O, and um, create conversations amongst yourselves, if you'd like, and post pictures, comments, uh, text people through the app. And also, we have special features, interviews with the speakers, uh, things they've written that you can download. So if you're interested, uh, I encourage you to, to download it. And, and, and then and you're, when you fill out your surveys at the end of the two days, let us know um, how you like it. Uh, I, hope you had a, I hope some of you, I saw there was a good breakout session here. We have more breakout sessions, including one at 6.30 right after the last talks. So I hope you'll all avail yourself of those. Those are my announcements. Um, uh, we have two talks coming up now, uh, and then a break, and then uh, two final talks. So I'm very much looking forward to this uh, afternoon session. Uh, it is my real honor now uh, to, to introduce um, someone who's one of my favorite writers. Uh, I first read his book, Blood Horses, uh, which um, I have recommended to countless friends and students. Uh, as an example of, of how to write brilliant memoir and thinking about the world um, on a very personal level. Uh, it's, it's, it's an excellent, uh, one of my favorite books, and I encourage you to read it. Uh, he also wrote a, a collection of amazing essays called Pulphead, and he has a new book, which we've been eagerly awaiting, uh, coming out next year, called The Prime Minister of Paradise. Um, John Jeremiah Sullivan is one of really the, 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 uh, the excellent and, and, and prized writers uh, of our period. He writes frequently in the New York Times where he's an editor, and he is the southern editor of the Paris Review, um, which, is a, which is relevant because his talk is called The Problem of the South. Please welcome John Jeremiah Sullivan. Thank you, Roger, and, and to Bard for, for having me, and thank you all for the honor of, of addressing you. Um, I'm going to try to, uh, re really more than to, more than to prosecute an argument in the form of an essay, to, to, to just um, try to bring some ideas to the surface that I hope <clears throat> Roger and I can talk about more, and that we can then talk about when, when, when we move into the Q&A. Um, that for me is when all the most productive stuff happens. Anyway, when I'm, when I'm shaken out of what I had prepared to say and, and shaken into some actual thinking. Um, this, this re this, this, these thoughts grew for me out of um, uh, 20 years of research I've done on this book. Um, when you say 20 years, that's, you're past the point of signaling moral heroism and into, and into psychosis. So I, I don't, may, I make no apologies or, or have no 
have no defense on that, but, um, but it has meant that I've spent a lot of time thinking about uh, the problem of the South and the Enlightenment. Uh, a, 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 a minor but very interesting um, problem in American historiography. So I want to just explore that a little bit. Um, the book I'm writing is about a man named Preber who left his home in, in Germany, in the German-speaking lands. He lived in, in easternmost Saxony, as far east as you can go without crossing into Poland and the Czech Republic. And he was extremely well-educated. He was a lawyer from, from one of the old Berger families there and a linguist and a, a student at Leipzig. Um, he left home in the 1730s and went to South Carolina, um, which was already a strange thing to do for, for a person from that part of the world. There were plenty of Europeans moving through the South already by that time. They had been for a couple of hundred years, but, but uh, you, you didn't see many Central Europeans, which is really what he was. The part of, part of Germany he comes from is, is, is considered the gateway to Central Europe, a little town called Sitau. Um, and when he got to South Carolina, he did a very strange thing, which is the reason we remember him in history, which is that he disappeared into the back country and went and lived with the Cherokee Indians for six years. And during that time, he was adopted into the tribe. Uh, he married a Cherokee woman, although he still had uh, a German wife at home. And he, um, and he began tattooing his body. He really, he really underwent a kind of physical transformation. But what he was doing during all of those years was carrying out a kind of utopian political experiment. Although utopia in this sense is precisely the wrong word because, uh, because it, it, was a, it was a place, a very real place. In fact, you can still go to it. It's called Teleco Plains. It's in southeastern Tennessee. And while Preber was there living, living with the Cherokee, as well as other Native Americans who had come from what they call remnant tribes, tribes that had been decimated so thoroughly that, that they were now escaping and finding shelter with, with other unaffiliated tribes, as well as runaway African and African American slaves. It's a, it's, it's, it, was, it was a mixed race community that he found shelter in. And he began he began devising a kind of plan for, for a city that he wanted to build. He called it the Republic of Paradise. And um, bear in mind, this is the 1730s and 40s, so Jefferson hasn't been born. Uh, Rousseau has barely written a word. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a radical thing that he's doing because, and, and, and even if you look at the most well-read and sophisticated timeline of utopian thinking in the 18th century, you'll see that, that in, in the first half, it's supposed to be fantastic for the most part, imaginative. Um, and then in the second half, you begin to get the, the, the experiments that lead up to the revolutionary period. But in fact, but, but, but Preber is one of these people who uh, makes trouble for that timeline. And, um, and having studied him now for, for, for many years, I'm convinced that it, that it really needs to be abandoned because there were a lot more of these experiments even than we know. But, um, but the, the truly extraordinary thing is that this paradise that Preber wanted to build was to be socialistic. Uh, he advocated a kind of, a kind of socialist democracy. Uh, feministic, he was interested in, in women's rights, including the right to divorce. Which was, which was, you know, those were fighting words at the time, and um, it was, and, and it was explicitly to be a multiracial society. In one of the documents that I discovered in doing the research that hadn't been woven into the story yet, a kind of table of contents for a utopian book that he was writing, he he, he makes clear in, in in one place that he wants his uh, his society to include uh, Turks, by which he means. Muslims, he wants it to include um, a pagans, which was the word he used to refer to the Native Americans. He's thinking in religious categories really more than anything, as well as Christians and Jews, and those who profess no revealed religion, who are commonly called atheists. 
which is one of the most important sentences in, ev in everything I've found about him because it, it, it tells us where to dial him in on the grid of intellectual history. He was clearly a Spinozistic thinker, a follower of, of, of the great Spinoza. Um, and, uh, and as such, what they would have called an atheist at the time, although he wouldn't have, qu have quite defined himself that way, I don't think. The experiment went on for six years. Um, he had a kind of right-hand man during all of that time, a man named Yama, uh, who was, who was uh, an African slave via New Orleans, and, but, but, was, but had been born in West Africa, probably in a place called Yama that's up the Gambian River in Senegal. I was there once when I was a teenager. There's a very ancient mosque there. It's a center of Islamic of Islamic culture in that part of Africa, or, or, or a kind of a kind of landmark, um, and and this man Yama had run away from the Cherokee. He'd been captured. He jumped out of the boat. It's a very dramatic scene, and 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 was captured by the Cherokee who were living with Preber. They brought him into the village, and and Preber uh, began discussing these ideas with him, and Yama became a kind of comrade. Anyway, I, 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 I won't tell you the whole story, of course, um, but, uh, but the English hunted him for several years. They, 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 they wanted him dead or, or in prison at any cost because the thing he was advocating was the most terrifying idea they could conceive of and remained that for, for uh, a massive section of Southern history, namely the idea that the that the blacks and Native Americans and disaffected whites would get together, would, would recognize their common cause against the colonial elites who, who at that point were representing, um, were representing the, the, the administration of, of, of George II and, and Walpole and all, you know, it was, it was, it was capitalism at any cost. And this is, the, this is one of the darkest moments in American history because if you think about Charleston, 1730, the Indian removals are really beginning in earnest now, the process, the process that's going to lead to the Trail of Tears. And plantation slavery is really being exported to the West now in the form that we'll come to know it in the 19th century. So it's, 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 it's just a, a, a very dark place. And here you have this, this man who shows up and really a group of people um, including Yama's wife, whose name we know, it was Jeanette. It's, it's so rare we get to recover life details for 18th century slaves like that. That was an exciting part of the research. Those records were survived in um, the basements of old churches in, <clears throat> in Louisiana. Uh, but um, they finally did catch him, um, and, and, and they, they were arresting him on the charge of sedition against the crown, and they caught him on a river he was in a canoe, and um, he, he surrendered himself. But Yama, who was with him, f fearing probably rightfully that he would be, be taken back to the plantation, um, dove into the river and was shot in the back by the a mixed group of, of Creek Indians and, and English who were, who were sent to arrest him as mercenaries, essentially. So they threw Preber into prison on an island fortress off the coast of... South Car uh, off the coast of Georgia, rather, and, uh, and that's where he died. And his famous book was lost to history, this kind of, this, this, this very tantalizing kind of lost text because uh, it, 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 would, it would mark the first time that an, an Enlightenment work had come out of New World conditions rather than having been written in, in, in reflection of them somehow. We're, we're familiar with the whole the, you know the whole the, the noble savage phenomenon in that in that century, but that's that's purely a European product that's looking at America and has some limited anthropological encounter, you know exposure uh, to to the New World. But but this was really this is an Enlightenment text that was written from America and not just from America, but from South Carolina and Tennessee, um, two two states that would not distinguish themselves in the march of Enlightenment thinking over the next you know couple of hundred years. Um, during, during all that time that I was working on Preber and so working on a very tiny little microscopic part of, of, this, of this problem, 
uh, the scholar Jonathan Israel, who's at the um, um, Institute for the Advancement of, of um, Human Study at, uh, at Princeton, was, was uh, performing, I think, the most profound intervention in, in, in the way the history of the Enlightenment gets told of the last, of the last generation plus. Um, and some of you may, may know that work. He, he, he gives it the, the general title, The Radical Enlightenment. It's 3,000 3, page volumes, incredibly dense, full of names you've never heard. Uh, it can make for very dry reading, which is probably one of the reasons it hasn't been absorbed into our political discussion the way I think it should be and the way I want to argue today that it should be. Um, uh, but, if you, but if you read it with a certain mindset, namely the idea that you're being given a completely new vantage point on the Enlightenment as it developed um, after, say, 1660 or so and, and, and on into the 18th century, um, you, you're hearing a story that's never been told before. He, he, he tells the story of, 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 of the Enlightenment as, as social history, essentially. So you're with the minor thinkers and forgotten writers and teachers and people who are just a lot, a lot more like us in some ways. They seem curiously modern sometimes, who are really uh, receiving these ideas and dealing with the tumult of them politically, emotionally, all sorts of ways. And and Israel's argument, which he makes over 3,000 pages, obviously, so I won't even try to paraphrase it, but the, but the, you know, the, 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 the one-sentence version is that the Enlightenment is much more crucially dis descended from Spinoza than we have ever realized, and that there's a very specific reason for this, namely that Spinoza's name and work were so dangerous for so long. It was, you, you know, you could, you could lose your life for for trafficking in those books for, for a big part of the period we refer to as the Enlightenment, at least in certain countries. And, um, and that means something very significant uh, in philosophical terms, in political terms, in historical terms, because Spinoza was an apostle of toleration and of the, the, the set of values that we now associate with the term radical Enlightenment, religious tolerance, um, a, kind of, uh, a kind of tolerant atheism in, in, in the matter of, uh, of religion and um, emphasis on social equality. He was, he was a thinker still, still ahead of our time even in many ways, not without his faults of course, um, but uh, w w which Israel is sensitive to I think. That, but there has, been a great, there has been a great backlash against Israel's work because I think the, the, the maneuver he's trying to perform is so dramatic and so severe and I understand that. I think it's responsible on the part of scholars when something like that happens to say maybe it's not quite as, as different uh, as, you're, as you're arguing. But I, I do think that when you, when you, when you take in the, 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 the mass of his evidence you see that we have been misreading the Enlightenment in a, in, in a funda fundamental way, the actual documents, I mean. And um, I'm, I'm, I realize I'm using very, these, these terms in a, just a criminally broad way, but that's only because I don't want to go beyond 15 or 20 minutes. Um, we can get into details if it's interesting to everyone else, but, but um, when, you, when you go back and, and reread the sort of classic tradition of those texts after having taken, taken in this reorientation, after having dealt with it, um, you see, among other things, how insane it would be to argue that the American experiment as it was, as it was officially launched in the 1770s was anything other than a pure product of a deeply liberal, deeply iconoclastic intellectual tradition, not at all in keeping or even in sympathy with so many of the ideas that we're hearing now. And, and, and for me, it brought home in a, in a very powerful way just what a betrayal of our, of our tradition. Um, branches of the conservative movement have, have, have been willing to, to commit, I think, in, in, in recent years. So, 
I want to propose that that the way we can get it together, if I can say we and, and, and loosely mean the left at the same time, not presuming anyone's political opinions, but, but just looking at it objectively, the way we can get it together and face, I, I think, some of the most dire challenges we've faced as a society on a political level, and, 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 and challenges so dire that we don't really even understand them, that we don't have a point of reference, like the climate. Um, the secret to doing that, to, 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 to rallying ourselves for that challenge, it seems to me will have to involve a new reckoning with the Enlightenment and a reckoning with the possibility that we were somewhat premature in throwing it off the way we did in, in, in the face of the, of the challenges of, of post-structuralism. And I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's been such, a, such a, an important part of our intellectual drama in the last, in the last 50 years has been this, this, this attack on the enlightenment, this getting it off of our shoulders, getting out from under it. But I think it may have been a baby with the bathwater situation in many ways. And Preber convinced me of that. And many of the lost stories that I've been finding in the South are, are, are convincing me of that, that there are roots here that are accessible to us and, 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 that, are, and that are deeply important and that represent the true, the true marrow of, of the tradition we're trying to hold together. And, and while it is true that, that the Enlightenment is, is vulnerable to attack on, on many fronts. And, and while it is true that enlightenment ideas could be perverted and, and turned into um, really murderous politics and colonial scenarios especially, it is also true, and this is what Israel has shown, that a counter argument against that very corruption has existed inside the enlightenment from the beginning was much louder, much more, much more um, um, uh, thoroughly elaborated than, than we've known. There were people thinking about how would an Enlightenment Republic actually behave in a, in, in a new world scenario and reaching very different conclusions. So that is exciting to me as a, as a kind of, as a, as a source. There's a great William Carlos Williams sentence in, in his book, uh, um, In the American Grain, he, talk, he talks about a Jesuit priest named Father Rail who, who, who worked among the who worked among the Native Americans and in, in um, closer to your part of the country, and and lost his life trying to trying to protect their rights. And Williams says, "This is a moral source not reckoned with." And that that that, that is that's been the gift of my obsession with Preber in my life is realizing that, um, for instance, what they call intersectionality now. Uh, that, that, that's a word that, you know, I went to a school where we were still reading the new criticism, so we were taught to make fun of words like that and assume that they couldn't possibly have any meaning since they'd had to be invented. But, but, but the more I think about this word, the more I think it is the word we need most now, or at least the concept it expresses is one of the most important we're, we're dealing with now, which is, the, which is getting together and, and not allowing the narcissism of minor difference to weaken the power of the argument on our side, which I think it has in, in, in many respects, in many places. Um, and, and I think, um, well, it's a strange thing to say, but, if, but, but who's reading us best right now from an analytical point of view, who's really paying attention to the American left and thinking, how can we, how can we cripple it? Um, and, and these are some extremely smart people, by the way, and, 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 and computer hackers and statisticians. What, what do we do? How can we stop it? By, by sowing division, by exacerbating division, racial, ideological, social, and that and that 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 process has to end. I feel like before we can move forward. I mean, one of the one of the to me one of the real political moments in, in the last ten years in America was the failure of the of the of the middle class to get behind the Occupy movement to recognize commonality of cause there. And as a result, I feel like it was somewhat left on the left on the vine to wither.
but imagine if that if a power like that were to were to get into the street so i just wanted to put those things into the air and um and i'm hoping that we can we can explore them more and thank you for listening Thank you very much, John. Um, so, I mean, the story about Preber is, is fascinating, as is your recovery of, of the radical enlightenment through Israel. Um, I guess you, you mentioned the American experiment and the betrayal of it. And so I guess maybe what I want to start with is how you understand the sort of radicalness of the American experiment. Um, and I'll just put one thought out there, right, which is, Han Arendt, right, um, also thought that the American experiment was one of the most radical and new and important um, events in world history. One that has been, un she thought, has been underappreciated in relation to other, like the French Revolution. And, but her, and her um, valuing of it was because it created, she says, um, a politics without sovereignty, right? We talked a little bit about sovereignty with Micah. He wants sovereignty. Um, but what she said is there were multiple power sources. There was the federal, there was the state, there was the local. But in the end, there was this movement of coarse township governance, right? We talked about with Tocqueville. I mentioned that earlier. And that there was no one sovereign. Um, and, and that this was the radicalness of the revolution because the only thing that can resist power is other power sources, not a constitution, not laws, not ethics. But more than that, it was what allowed people to get involved in polit the political world, because you're only going to get involved if there's something at stake, namely power. So that was her view of the radicalness of it. And you know, one of the things we can see going on both the Tea Party and Occupy and other groups is there's been a disempowerment of people, and the question is, people are yearning to get back involved. Um, so I guess what I'm wondering is, first, you know, what do you see as the radical notion of the American Revolution? Let's start there. Well, you, you, you mentioned Hannah Arendt, and, and um, I went to her work for clarification on some of this, and, and um, I, I thought I was asking kind of a novel, interesting question by saying, uh, I wonder what Hannah Arendt thought about the South. Yeah, I wonder if she ever wrote a stray sentence about, about the South. Turns out she was deeply interested in the problem of the South. And, and, and as, as she, I guess should not be surprising, she goes at it with a, with a scalpel and gets immediately to what's, to what's going on. She, she begins by making the distinction between a nation state and a republic. That this for her is, a, you know, just an all-important distinction. And a nation, you know, and I guess one way of making that distinction is to say that a nation state is is primarily a product of historical accident. People who have who have blood ties find themselves in one on one part of the earth and and uh, you know forced to to fight for their interests and. And things evolve from there. Whereas the Republic is 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 a, um, an act of the imagination, at the same time that it's a that it's a political and social reality. And I think that that seems to have been what what she found most beautiful about the American experiment that we had gotten together in a scenario that probably should not have worked out. And let's be honest, did not work out for 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 many of the people who were there at the time it was conceived, or since for that matter. But but. There was the, there, there was a kind of um, a decision to to create something in which we could all exist together politically, and so the possibilities immediately are just are just uh, they expand so quickly from there, and and uh, the possibilities for equality, uh, you know, I guess most importantly, and and um, you know, in, in a sense, it's hard to talk about about the, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence without thinking of them as in some ways 18th century utopian documents that were not, that, that, that 
would have belonged in the room with what someone like Preber was doing. They don't seem that way to us because we continue to live under them. This utopia has become our, our, our topos, you know, it's our place. Um, and, and, and has proved to be anything but perfect. But Arendt says the problem in America that is that, it, that it is, is that it is a, a republic that is in danger of slipping back into the condition of a nation state. And she's saying this, I mean, the, 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 the perspicacity of that is pretty awesome, I think. And, and she says uh, that the, the, the reason for this, she goes right to the race problem. She says, how could it not be the case? You enslaved millions of people. They're still with you. You don't know what to do with each other. You haven't figured it out yet. And, and she says, it's a, it's right now, it's primarily a problem in the South because that's where the African-American population is. But as people, as people move, it will become more of a national problem. You'll see this racism being called out of the shadows in cities where you don't expect it. She's just, I just, you know, it's, it's crystal ball. And, and then she says, then she goes to Faulkner. It's wonderful, you know, um, and says, uh, you know, she, she loved Faulkner. She, she considered him one of the few American writers who, who really had, had, had reached the kind of depths that, that, a, that, a, that a Tolstoy or a writer like that had, had found. And she says, but listen to him when he says things like, well, uh, if there were another war, I would have to side with, um, with the state of Mississippi, you know? And she, and she just calls bullshit on that, for lack of a better word, in, 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 in the way that the South needs to have needs to have that called on it more often because the, the the civil war was a was was a was a profound act of treason against the experiment we're talking about that was undertaken for incredibly petty reasons even even you know even to the extent that that the people fighting under understood the reasons or were interested in them so it's just it's it, it's a it's a in some ways a crude not a particularly elegant but i just thought a very a very correct and devastating read of of American history in that way and, and, and Southern history. And so she says, you know, you've got, you, you, you have to figure this out, then you can talk about how to really be united and then you can use the word Republic and, 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 it's, and it's the right word. The, this difference between a nation state and a Republic that you've mentioned, which is, I think, beautifully expressed. You know, she, she's deeply skeptical of a nation state, a state based on a nationality. Um, and she thinks a state is a group of equals, as you rightly said. But she also understands the need for some sort of a meaningful, transcendent bond amongst people in any political entity. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, you've, you've mentioned to me in conversation and in some of your writing this idea of the American idea. What is a non-national or non-white racial as you put it, understanding of the American idea? And is the South part of that? Well, it's, it, it's the most difficult question, I guess, so it's fair that you ask it. I, I, um, the closest thing I've found to an answer is, is, is in history. And I think that's why this material is, is so fascinating to me. And what, what I see there is not only that we have been trying to perfect this experiment for much longer than we think in places where we would not expect to see it happening, that we, um, that we have been aware of some of its fatal problems from, from earlier than I at least would ever have dreamed, and, and that, well, and, and, and let me just expand on that a little bit so it doesn't sound like I'm just throwing stuff out specifically. I mean, some of the, you know, um, there's an amazing family called Lorenz in Charleston, South Carolina, the Lorenz family. Preber interacted with one, one or two generations of them, but they, they were uh, passionate abolitionists. And, and, and you know, in the, in, in the real, in the, in the nastiest part of the South when it came to racial politics, and, and they, they really admired the Moravians, you know, these pietist, um, Arendt would have known exactly what that meant. That's a deep utopian wind that's blowing through that's blowing through Europe in the 18th century. The Moravians were living in these communitarian Christian colonies. They were very 
interested in seeking out African people and Native American people and, and bringing them into this, um, what was almost a kind of Quaker um, uh, system. And the Lorenz family had seen these Moravians moving through the, through the landscape and, and, and thought, and, 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 and they were convinced, and they were very influential. They were not marginal figures. They were, I mean, uh, in fact, Henry uh, Lorenz and John Lorenz, both the father and son, were, were Revolutionary War heroes. And, and, and there's even this amazing moment when John Lorenz, so many moments like this that I, that I go to when talking about this subject, what are, the, what, what are the possibilities of healing that divide? What can we look to? to um, John Lorenz goes to the Continental Congress. He's, he's, he's in the North and, and he asks permission. He says, I want to go. I want you to send me back down to South Carolina and I'm going to draft hundreds of slaves into, a, into an African army. I want to lead this army. When the war is over, they'll all be free. Um, these extraordinary letters between him, between that young man and his father, who shares his sentiments but is more skeptical or really more cynical than anything and says, um, you know, you're, I, I admire your black air castle, but I regret to inform you that it was laughed out of the room when it came before the, before the, the house in Charleston and you, you can't, you know, how could you think these men would ever do that? And, and um, and he says, uh, oh, he, one very interesting thing he says is, even if we'd, we were to attempt it, our friends in the North would never allow it, right? Who was making the real money, right? They're in New York. No, that's, that's, that's a part that often gets forgotten and that in a funny way can help us achieve this kind of unified view of it since, it, since culpability was everywhere. Um, but, uh, but, but, but so, so what I mean by finding all of these, by, by trying to gather together some of these lost examples from our history, that can become a kind of cheap history, I realize, where we make a lot out of something that was seen as freakish even at the time and try to make an argument that things really could have gone another way. But this is, this is deeper than that. This is, this is a problem we knew was there and we decided to handle it in a certain fashion and we've all, we've all suffered. For, from that, I mean, I, th I think of our, our, our way of looking at race, our racial thinking in America is 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 a, is, a, is psychotic, and I feel like we all are, are brought up in it, you know. So 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 maybe we can start there as a <laughs> common ground. I don't think it's cheap. I mean, I think what you're saying is we need stories that define who we are, as opposed to nations or races. We have just a couple minutes left. I want to get some of you into it, so I'm going to open it up to questions. Let me take two two questions for John, and, and, then, um, and then we will s let him answer them. Are there questions or comments? Uh, I see one right there. I can barely see in those lights. Right there. Are you familiar with H uh, the uh, congressional rep uh, proposal, H.R. 40? Um, it, it, it's reparations. It has been introduced. Uh, into the House of Representatives for how many years now? It, it's been there for a while, and I think more than any piece of legislation that I've ever seen brings up right in our face. It would actually provide monetary reparations to African Americans for the horrors of slavery. And the representative from, I believe he's from Michigan, keeps introducing it every year. And there are just a handful of representatives that are brave enough to, to, to actually co-sponsor this. Have you seen any of that? And if that's not the answer, <laughs> is there another answer? I, I am familiar with it. I was, I, I was an editor at Harper's Magazine uh, 15 years ago when, when Jack Hitt, who's, who's in New Haven, organized a, a forum of, um, the, 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 a former Supreme Court judge was on it and, um, and a couple of African American historians and some other people to, to, to talk about that issue. Let's, let's, let's get the money, let's, let's get real about this and, and stop, stop the rhetoric. And um, so, I, so I, I've been following it closely and I don't, you know, it's, it's a subject that I, I guess I'm a little sheepish to talk about it in some ways. I, uh, morally, 
it's, 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 it's painfully obvious that it's the right thing to do. I mean, that's never been better proved, proved by this, this new uh, movement that's happening, uh, slavery and universities, you, you, individual universities looking, in the ex looking at the extent to which slave labor and slave money um, had, had, had made their existence possible in the early days and trying to compensate some of the descendants. So they're already private, private um, efforts being made at that, at the, uh, at, at the reparations. But, but, but I guess the, what, what I mean about feeling uncertain is, is it seems like the kind of, the kind of issue that I, I worry that our society is not, is not, um, is not there yet. And that this would that, that that this would just be like setting off a nuclear bomb, and would take whatever whatever f kind of political fracturing we're living with now, and just and just you know put it on steroids. Not necessary. Not in, not a bad thing in all cases. In in our in our scenario, it it, it seems a little scary. Um, but I I think it's something that we have to, we have to move toward. Uh, but 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 it would be nice if first we could educate white people who can be educated to the idea that healing the racial crimes, the 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 the, the deep racial crimes in our history against African American people, against the Native Americans, what was done to them is almost unimaginable, and that's a big part of the Preber story too. Um, they need to be made to understand that healing this is is necessary to the advancement of our experiment of our experiment and the survival of it. When you look against what we're up against now, it is it, it, it really you know if 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 the climate if there's one good thing to be said about this nightmare we're facing with the climate it is that it's forcing us to think concretely about something that in the past had been abstract and that is what what. That the human that that the human race is the only is is the only meaningful unit, and um, and uh, yeah, that, I realize that sounds a little hippy dippy, but it comes down to that so often, you know. John, one last one last comment or question. The South, in many ways, is active now. I mean, both. Um, a lot of Black Lives Matter started in the South and is active in the South. But also the Tea Party and much of the Trump movement and like Ray Moore, uh, who just won the primary in the South, clearly very active. Um, is there, you know, some people have said the South is always more honest than the North and maybe the solutions come from the South. Is there any hope in your mind that the South becomes a place where these conversations uh, become, um, uh, open up new possibilities for a, a common identity and a common idea? Or are you, do you see it just as a problem? No, no, that's truly what I hope, what you're, what, what you're expressing is that, is that because we are the place that w w the, the place where the insanity reaches its maximum that, that that maybe in that chaos there are solutions too and it's and, and it's kind of amazing that you ask this now because um i've been i've been do, uh, doing a lot of work in the last few years on the 1898 massacre in wilmington north carolina where i live um and and, and some of you may have read about that it's 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 a it's a, a, a terrible and extremely consequential moment in american history when there was an actual white supremacist coup against uh against a government that was beginning to include more and more african american people freed slaves and and their children and um and it was never it was never reversed uh, the federal government al al allowed it to happen allowed it to pass so the so the white supremacists essentially took back the the democratically elected government of what at the time was the wealthiest most important city in North Carolina you know power hadn't shifted to the center yet from the coast it shifted partly because of what happened in 1898 which which was that a mob formed they burned down the African American paper in town they drove out all the leaders in that community and the sympathetic whites at the same time put them on two trains um, again, we get into the story of powerful whites fearing interracial cooperation. We have to remember that. 
it, that means something. If they fear it, it means it's powerful. If we ourselves are working against it, that's a problem. Um, and and, and uh, they, they killed as many as 100 people. They brought out a kind of machine gun. And uh, it, it's just, it, it, you know, it's, it's just, it, it's horrific what happened. But the reason they were so furious, I'm realizing as I get deeper into the documents, is something new was being created there in that town. There was this, there was an interracial society happening. The most important judge in town, he lived in the biggest house in town on Market Street, had a wife who was considered colored, as they said at the time, and she was pregnant, and he was making no apologies. And it was totally unacceptable to them. I mean, you know, it strikes me that when we read someone like Tocqueville who talks about how civilization can't tolerate the freedom of coarse townships, we often think of the racist townships, mm -hmm. but there's also the experimenting, progressive townships yes. that it can't tolerate. And yes, Preber called his experiment a town at the foot of the mountains. That was his, for, which is such a beautiful contradistinction to the city on the hill. You know, it was a town at the foot of the mountains, real people living together, and 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 just let, and letting go of their, of their prejudices, letting go of the ideas of their grandparents. Well, with that beautiful image of the town at the foot of the mountains, um, please join me in thanking John Jeremiah Sullivan.